Tonight, a tense phone call between President Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu as outcry grows over the war in Gaza. Why Israel is now bracing for a potential showdown with Iran. And they are shelling 24 hours a day, seven days a week. NATO allies meet in Europe while Ukraine's front lines stand on the brink of collapse. See how Ukrainian Christians are risking their lives to be a light in the darkness. Plus, over time, we can significantly decrease or even eliminate your symptoms altogether. Spring is officially here, and so is allergy season. What you can do to get your symptoms under control. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. The White House is making its strongest push yet for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Welcome to Faith Nation, everyone. From the CBN News headquarters in Virginia Beach, I'm Wendy Griffith, in tonight for John and Jenna. President Biden spoke with Prime Minister Netanyahu today for the first time since the deadly Israeli airstrike on aid workers in Gaza this week. It's the latest in ongoing tensions between the two leaders over Israel's handling of the war. CBN's White House correspondent Abigail Robertson joins us now with the latest details. Abigail. Well, Wendy, it was apparently a tense call between Biden and Netanyahu. Biden made clear that he thinks the humanitarian crisis in Gaza and the accidental Israeli strike that killed seven foreign aid workers are unacceptable. He also called for an immediate ceasefire. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told reporters the president signaled U.S. policy could soon shift if Israel does not announce specific, measurable steps to address civilian harm and humanitarian suffering. Take a look. He made clear that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. He underscored as well that an immediate ceasefire is essential to stabilize and improve the humanitarian situation and protect innocent civilians. And he urged Prime Minister Netanyahu to empower his negotiators to conclude a deal without delay to bring the hostages home. Now, Blinken also reaffirmed strong U.S. support for Israel, acknowledging what happened after October 7th could have ended immediately if Hamas had released the hostages and stopped hiding behind civilians. But he emphasized Israel is not Hamas and they must place a value on human life amid the dire situation in Gaza. Wendy? Very interesting. Thank you so much, Abby. Well, turning now to tensions in Europe, NATO leaders are in Belgium today to mark the alliance's 75th anniversary. The top item on the agenda? Russia's war against Ukraine. Today, Secretary of State Antony Blinken promising it's only a matter of time before Ukraine joins the alliance. Ukraine will become a member uh, of NATO. Uh, our purpose at the summit is to help build a bridge to that membership uh, and uh, to create a clear pathway for, uh, for Ukraine uh, moving forward. Today, NATO members agreed to boost Ukraine's air defenses, but didn't offer any concrete plans. The alliance also has yet to decide if it will greenlight a proposal to send Ukraine $100 billion in funding over the next five years. Well, more than two years into Russia's invasion, Ukraine is lowering its draft eligible age for men from 27 to 25. The move is meant to bolster the country's beleaguered troops. Ukrainian forces and supplies are running low. President Vladimir Zelensky says if Western allies don't offer more aid soon, troops will begin to retreat from the front lines. He warns if that happens, major Ukrainian cities could fall into Russian hands. Joining us now is Brad Bowman, the senior director of the Center on Military and Political Power at Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Brad, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, Brad, according to Zelensky, unless they receive the stalled multi-billion dollar package soon, it's game over. His forces will have to retreat and they could possibly lose some major cities to Russia. Do you agree that the situation is this dire? I do agree that the situation is very serious. I'm not sure I'd use the word game over, you know, but no doubt some Ukrainian military officers and officials have warned of a potential collapse in, in, in parts of the Ukrainian front lines. And the Russians have been increasing their offensive operational tempo. 
along the front line and increasing the size and number of their mechanized assaults. And so, and, and they have made gains in recent months because the Ukrainians have lacked some of the munitions that they need. And I would note that NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg said yesterday that, quote, the Ukrainians are not running out of courage, they're running out of ammunition. So Zelensky is saying uh, prudently that if they don't get some of these weapons and munitions that they've been begging for to defend their homes against this unprovoked Russian invasion, that he will have to have tactical or operational retreats. And you do that so that you avoid a breakthrough that could be more catastrophic and, and begin to give the uh, Kremlin an opportunity to gain even more Ukrainian territory. Well, Brad, even if the package is approved by Congress, would a massive resupply really help avoid a major battle, uh, battlefield upset for Ukraine? You know, in, in the current uh, battlefield that we're seeing, it's, it's much more difficult to conduct combined arms offensive operations than it is to defend static entrenched positions. So there's no doubt the Ukrainians will not be able to go on a counteroffensive because they've been deprived of resources. The Russians will struggle to make gains, but they have made some tactical gains. The point is, is that once the, uh, uh, the, the House of Representatives, frankly, uh, stops sitting on its hands like it's been doing for months, uh, then the flow of weapons from the U.S. arsenal can resume because one of the ways we provide those weapons is with presidential drawdown authority where we literally transfer weapons in our own, our own arsenal and some of those can arrive within days. You know, I'm curious, uh, what would have to happen for NATO to say, okay, look, money and weapons are not, not enough. We need to put boots on the ground. We need to send in troops. I don't see that happening anytime soon because that would put uh, NATO forces and, and, and potentially U.S. forces in direct conflict with Russian forces, uh, something we avoided for 40 years during the Cold War. I think it would be far wiser for the House of Representatives to pass the National Security Supplemental that the administration proposed in October and that the Senate passed months ago and give our Ukrainian neighbors a baseball bat over the back fence to beat up the home invader so that home invader doesn't invade our home next and reconsiders his line of work. Well, that is great advice, um, Brad. We thank you so much for being with us today on Faith Nation. Thank you. Well, moving on, one of the biggest battlegrounds in the Ukraine war is the southern city of Kherson. Residents there are under constant bombardment. But through it all, Ukrainian Christians are risking their lives to serve those trapped by war. George Thomas brings us this exclusive report from the front lines. Kherson is a city under siege. They are shelling 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Many buildings here are destroyed. Sadly, I've gotten accustomed to the explosions and destruction. CBN News traveled to this front line in the south and found a virtual ghost town. Streets practically empty, homes left vacant. Most everything boarded up. 80% of Kherson residents fled more than two years ago. For Andrea Brynyov, a dentist who decided to stay back, it's been a constant struggle. I have constant tension. When you go to work, when you go home from work, when you're at home, it's never ending and made worse when the explosions are nearby. Yet it's in this extremely dangerous and volatile environment where Ole Derkenchenko feels called to minister. My church to the Dnieper River is about 700 meters. The width of the river is about 700 meters. So the Russians are about 1.5 kilometers from us. And from there, they are bombing us very often. The Dnieper River divides Kherson with the left bank controlled by Russian forces and the right by Ukrainians. Derkanchenko's church sits on the Ukrainian side. There are times when Russian shells fall 25 meters left of the church and sometimes 30 meters right of the church, but nothing touches us. God protects us. Before Russia's 2022 invasion, Pastor Derkenchenko says about 100 people would regularly attend his Sunday services. Today, in the middle of a raging war and less than a mile from Russian forces, his church is overflowing. Since Christmas of 2022, around 500 people, 
Sometimes as many as 700 people attend the church. We have a full yard of people on Sundays. Her son has seen it all. Invasion, occupation and liberation. And now, despite the danger of Russian forces possibly crossing the Dnieper River to retake her son, the church doors remain open. Two years after uh, the war started here in Ukraine, the church is thriving. This used to be an evangelical church, completely destroyed. A bomb fell on top. Look at the bullet holes, the shrapnel holes. Obviously, they're not meeting here, but instead, they meet every Sunday in this tent. People understand that the church today is a center of hope and inner peace. On a recent Sunday, several people professed faith in Jesus Christ and took baptism in a tub. And just imagine, we even have people who come to the war zone just to visit our church from other districts. People often tell me that they feel calmer here in the church than at home, and it's only God's kindness. Serving here is obviously not without risk. The Russians know exactly where our church is. During the occupation of her son, literally 50 meters from here, there was a vehicle with Russian agents inside that were monitoring what we were doing in the church. Andriy Skansev, another Kherson pastor who stayed, spends his days with a small band of brothers delivering aid. When the Russians were retreating, they began to shell the entire city and one of the shells landed right here next to the church. You can see the damaged walls. Pastor Skansev says his church has also seen explosive growth. Before the war, about 150 people attended the church, but after the start of the war, two or three times more people started attending the church. Some got baptized, converted to Christianity. We had twice or thrice the amount of people who got baptized during the war. Most here know the Russians will have a tough time getting across the Dnieper River. That's because as they retreated in 2022, they blew up the Antonovsky Bridge which Pastor Derkenchenko can see from his church office. We are also praying that God can help our forces liberate the Russian-occupied territories on the left bank, because we have relatives and friends who live there. For now, though, the daily bombardment continues, and the church stands in the gap for its people and nation. Those people who decided to stay in this conflict zone are asking for help. And being here is extremely important, and to remain here is probably what it means to be a Christian, to show Jesus Christ. George Thomas, CBN News, Kherson, Ukraine. Wow, God bless them. Thanks, George. Well, crews work to clear Baltimore's collapsed bridge, the uphill battle divers are facing when Faith Nation continues. Welcome back. Former President Donald Trump facing a major setback in Georgia's 2020 election interference case against him. Today, a judge in the Peach State denied his request to dismiss criminal charges on the grounds that his claims about a stolen election were protected by free speech. While no trial date has been set, the case will continue to move forward. Well, crews are working around the clock to remove mangled parts of Baltimore's collapsed key bridge. Rough weather this week has hindered progress. Underwater divers are battling the rough conditions as they try to remove debris. The murky river leaving crews with just a foot of visibility to work with. It's extremely dangerous, especially with all the twisted metal, the roadway, um, and it's just, it's just something that you just got to go by feel. New Navy sonar images show parts of the bridge and the ship that took it down resting at the bottom of the Patasco River. Mm. Well, the Biden administration recently announced a dramatic rise in auto emission standards. The White House wants more Americans to buy electric cars to improve air quality and fight climate change. But with unsold EVs piling up on some car lots, some auto dealers say the market just isn't ready. Dale Hurd explains why. It's being called the most ambitious plan in U.S. history to eliminate auto emissions. Today marks a historic win for public health, for the environment, and for the future 
of our country. The Environmental Protection Agency is requiring automakers to reduce emissions by over 7 billion metric tons. To push the car industry to produce more electric vehicles with the goal of two out of three new car purchases being EVs in just eight years. The White House backed off an even harder earlier push toward electric vehicles because of its unpopularity in an election year. But should the White House and the EPA be telling automakers what kind of cars to sell to consumers? A lot of auto dealers don't think so. EVs made up less than 10 percent of car sales last year. And with unsold inventory of electric cars piling up at dealerships, 5,000 auto dealers sent a letter to the White House in January asking it to tap the brakes on its push toward EVs. Rick Germain, president of Germain Auto Specialist in Columbus, Ohio, says the demand for EVs now just isn't there and won't be for a long time. It's obviously the infrastructure, it's the range, um, uh, it's the cost. Those are the three things that we hear from customers. There's just, uh, for a lot of people, it just, it's, it's not a vehicle that makes sense. While the White House claims the reduced emissions will help save the world from global warming, it was the bitter cold this past winter that had some EV owners rethinking their purchases because their cars did not have enough battery power to drive as far as advertised. There's also a lack of charging stations in many areas. This is an idea whose time has not yet come. Diana Furcht Gott Roth is an economist at the Heritage Foundation. Look, this is great technology for people who don't have to drive very far and who have charging stations in their homes. But for other people, small businessmen, farmers who have to drive hundreds of miles a day, these vehicles do not work. They're not convenient. They're more costly. An F-150 Lightning pickup truck costs $26,000 more than the gasoline version. People can't afford those. The EPA claims the move to EVs will improve everyone's health, especially kids. That means less heart disease. That means longer lives. But Furcht Gott Roth says Americans will now hang on to their old gasoline-powered cars longer. And that's not safer. She also accuses the White House of trying to create a market for EVs that just isn't there. The federal government is spending your tax dollars to get manufacturers to make these vehicles and then spending more of your tax dollars to get people to buy them. And they're still not selling. Germain says the market should decide. Instead of trying to, to uh, force uh, a certain sort of technology on customers that may not be ready for it. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thank you, Dale. Well, those who own EVs know the frustration of not being able to find a charger. President Biden has long pledged to build 500,000 EV charging stations by 2030. The infrastructure measure President Biden signed back in 2021 included more than $7 billion for the program. But it appears the rollout is slow moving. The Washington Post reports to date only seven EV charging stations have been built so far. Well, up next, allergy season back with a vengeance. We share how you can beat the springtime struggle when Faith Nation returns. The nation's largest egg producer has halted operations at a Texas facility over an avian flu outbreak. An uptick in cases in cows and chickens is reported in five states. The Centers for Disease Control say two people have contracted the virus, the first known cases reported in the U.S. The CDC says the risk of human infection is low, but they are monitoring the situation. Has this virus changed or is it changing that would make it more likely to spread from human to human? The CDC says those who got the virus experienced mild symptoms. Well, are you among the one in four Americans who deal with seasonal allergy symptoms? The itchy eyes, running nose, and nonstop sneezing can be a struggle. Medical reporter Lori Johnson has more on how to find relief. This time of year, pollen often becomes public enemy number one, and it's floating all around, mainly from trees, grass, and weeds. Our level of discomfort often depends on where we live. Here in Virginia Beach, we really have a tough time because this is the second worst city in America for seasonal allergies, right behind Wichita, Kansas. 
Rounding out the top five, Greenville, South Carolina, Dallas, and Oklahoma City. The good news is you can find ways to minimize symptoms. We all like that fresh spring air to come in, but what's in that air? Pollen. So keep that out. That means staying inside, closing windows, and turning on the air conditioner. When you do go out, remember that pollen is a magnet and will stick to your clothes, hair, and skin. When you go back in the house, you can avoid spreading it by changing clothes and taking a shower. I always tell my patients to keep an allergy-free zone in their house, and that should be the bedroom because that's where you spend the most time and that's where you sleep. Frequently wash your sheets in hot water and pets can bring in pollen from the outside as well. You want to take uh, your pets, your loving animals out of your bed because that also will, uh, is a slew of allergenic um, antigens that will cause allergic reactions and respiratory issues. An air purifier can also help. Use a HEPA filter with a carbon filtration system. That combination is the best to clean the air inside. When it comes to treatment, experts say allergy shots tend to work best. And it increases the immune system's tolerance. So over time, we can significantly decrease or even eliminate your symptoms altogether. Patients start with a shot once a week, then taper off to once every eight weeks. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Such great advice. Thank you, Lori. Well, coming up, astronomers turn the sun into a symphony. We'll explain after this. Finally tonight, millions of people across the country are grabbing their protective glasses to take in the solar eclipse Monday. But you don't have to see it to experience it. Hundreds of people who are blind will also be able to enjoy the rare event thanks to a device that converts light into sound. Astronomer Allison Barilla first came up with the idea before the eclipse back in 2017. After a successful prototype, she secured funding to improve the device for this year's big eclipse, and the request came rolling in. We were trying to build 750, but we actually ended up building 900. The devices have been sent to libraries, museums, and schools around the country. Beautiful. Love it. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of Faith Nation. From all of us here, have a great evening. God bless.